I'm going to talk just a little bit about how my work and my faith interact. Um, and I work in the most secular medical specialty. When you look at all the medical specialties, there are fewer people who adhere to any, um, to any faith in psychiatry than there are in any other specialty. Um, and it's interesting maybe just for a minute to look at some of the reasons why this might be. And so we have the founders, some of the founders of psychiatry, and you have Freud seeing a defense mechanism, um, or seeing sorry, faith or religion as being a defense mechanism. And Jung, who was even somewhat more open to spirituality, um, was still anything but orthodox. And I think anything but orthodox is a generous expression of uh, his views on, on faith. Um, so, so from that point, it, it, it was always going to be quite secular. Also, the evolution of where psychiatry came from um, was always going to be quite secular. It, it came out of the penal system, whereas most of the hospitals came out of the um, religious orders and religious organizations. Um, it grew out of the prisons and was initially a, a ward in a prison, which slowly got moved off-site, and then eventually there were standalone psychiatric hospitals. So it didn't have the same... Um, it wasn't fed into in the same way by the religious organizations from such an early time. Also, psychiatrists had a number of pretty dark moments. Um, if you watch Behind the Walls, the RT documentary, or even you read Sebastian Barry's The Sacred Scripture, you see that there's often been some very dubious involuntary detention of people. In communist Russia, there was the um, diagnosis of sluggish schizophrenia, the main symptom of which really was nonconformity to um, communist ideals. Um, so you, and you have frontal lobotomies. You have a lot of pretty dark moments. So I see why it's one of the, the more secular um, specialties within medicine. But what I want to look at is where my faith and this, this particularly secular specialty interact. I keep using the word secular. I'm not even sure if I believe in that as a concept, but that's a whole other 10 minutes. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I want to look at where they interact. And rather than looking at how my faith influences my, my, my clinical practice, I want to look at how my practice, how my work has influenced my faith. Because I think all of us spend so much time in work, it clearly really shapes what we believe and how we live. And my job has really influenced me in some really positive ways and in some really negative ways. And I just want to share two of the simple and um, positive way that, ways that it has influenced me. And so I want to look at two ideas. Firstly, I want to look at honesty. And the one, the one caveat I want to say here is that the opposite of this is not dishonesty. Um, but I see a lot of people who, from such an early age, their feelings and their thoughts were so strongly invalidated that they now don't, aren't able to recognize what their feelings are. And this has huge interpersonal, uh, huge functional, huge op uh, occupational um, impacts on people. Um, I also see people who, when they expressed their emotional needs growing up, um, their needs went so unmet, they learned they have to express it in a different way. And so rather than express their needs in emotional terms, where they, where they fell on deaf ears, they started to express it through physical terms. And then maybe initially, consciously, but eventually subconsciously, people began to express psychological difficulties through physical pain, through seizures, through collapses. And I see, I see a lot of patients with both of these... Um, in both of these situations. And it's made me very keen that we would be a people who are honest about what we feel. It's made me very passionate that um, to be part of a community that is very open and very tolerant of different, of different feelings. Um, I, I think we could spend a whole time talking about the, the impact that, that the church has had on causing people to, to suppress feelings around human sexuality. But I actually want to park that, because I know we're going to come and, and talk about that later. Um, I had a friend who went through Bible college and suffered with depression and anxiety, and was made feel like a second-class citizen for that. I have a friend whose brother died, and when she grieved, um, she felt like she wasn't trusting in God's perfect plan. So often we have had, the, the church has in some ways done quite destructive things in this area, and I think we are improving. Um, but I think there's a need for us to be able to create an honesty, um, to be able to facilitate an honesty. And when people struggle to even be able to, to have that honesty itself, as, as I said, they're not being dishonest, but they've, they've never been in a safe enough environment where that honesty could even occur. Um, I would love to us, uh, the church to be a place where that honesty can be, 
can be facilitated and created. Um, I love Psalm 137. Um, this is, it's, it's a psalm which starts by the rivers of Babylon. Um, Boney M turned it into a kind of funky song in the 80s. <laughs> um, but no one in any of the songs goes to the last line of that psalm. The last line of, of that psalm, the psalmist says, wouldn't it be brilliant to take our captors' babies and dash them against rocks? No one goes there. Um, I kind of understand why. And is, this, is, this, is baby dashing a godly or an edifying or a, a, a beautiful way to live? No, 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 not at all. But I love the honesty. I love that in, in that psalm, there is, there is no fear. There's an ability to truly communicate the depth of somebody's hurt. And I would love if, we, if, if I could be a person and we could be a community that allowed people to begin to articulate that kind of honesty. My second point is somewhat related, um, and it's that idea of, of being unresolved. And I would love for there to be more of a voice of people in unresolved situations. I, I get so frustrated when it is the people who have succeeded, it is the people who have done really well, who have overcome incredible odds, who are victorious against some incredible opponent, who are, whose story we listen to because there are some really powerful stories from some people in really unresolved situations. And just because someone has been successful at something doesn't necessarily mean that we should listen to them and their story is of more worth um, than someone who is still in the midst of struggling with something. And I've put up a picture here of Robin Williams, someone who so profoundly touched so many people, but yet had so many unresolved areas, which ultimately culminated in his death by suicide. Um, but I see it. I see people who struggle with addictions and their really active struggle with addiction speaks something to me about the lies that I tell myself. I see people, families who look after relatives uh, with dementia, who in a really arresting and disturbing way teach me about love, though these situations are so unresolved. And I see people with depression and with psychosis who go to places of work or go to social uh, events with such courage that it is really, really inspiring. And, and so from these people in very unresolved situations, there are really powerful stories, and I would love for us to give more of a voice to people in unresolved situations. Um, and, and I love the, it's, it's already been mentioned, but the story of the rich young ruler. Um, and I wonder is, is why this story sticks in so many of our heads, because it's, because it's somewhat unresolved. Well, well, no, it's probably because he said, give away all your money, and that's why it sticks in our heads. <laughs> but it's part of the reason why it sticks in our heads, um, maybe more than the Nicodemus story, or the, the Zechariah, you know, hold on, the guy in the tree. Exactly, Zacchaeus, sorry, they, they blurred into one. Um, but um, maybe, maybe this story sticks in our head more than that one because it goes away and it's unresolved. And there's, there is some power in those unresolved stories. I would love to hear the stories of people who have given up praying because it's too painful. I'd love, and I, I really love that Ruth talked about the story of people who are walking away from church. There's some power in those stories. Um, and so I'd be really excited to hear them. And so these are just some of the ideas um, that that have kind of come out of this, the most secular of, um, of medical specialties that, that I've kind of learned about my faith from that. So thanks very much for your time. Yeah. Thanks.